women often say to me, I don't recognize myself anymore. When I look at myself in the mirror, I don't recognize the body that I'm in. Hello, everyone. It's Christine. Herzlichen willkommen, bienvenue, bienvenidos to the Rose Woman podcast. I'm your host, and every week we talk about some things that can create more love, liberation, spaciousness in our mind, bodies, and spirits. And today we are talking with Gabriela Espinosa, who is a woman who dives deep into yoga for all stages of life. And one of the key components of her teaching is yoga and self-acceptance. So I thought I would begin by talking to you a little bit about the yoga sutras and some of the aspects of those bits of the ancient text that can promote self-acceptance. So you know the yoga starts out with basically a little kind of 10 commandments, the yamas and the niyamas, the things you should not do and the things you should do. And there are five of each. And that comes even before you're doing breath work or you're doing postures. It's like, how do you live? How do you walk in the world? What's your core attitude? And within the yamas, the first one that I would say that's related to self-acceptance is the very first one of all, ahimsa or the practice of nonviolence, which includes non-harm towards oneself. This practice can lead to acceptance and compassion, even amidst your own perceived imperfections. And another is the practice of truthfulness. By being truthful in thought, word, and deed, you're more authentic. And when you're authentic, you can be with your own true nature without pretense. Uh, versus trying to adapt yourself to what society says you should do or how you should be. Other practices like svadhyaya or self-study uh, is an encouragement to do introspection and self-reflection to understand and accept one's strengths and weaknesses. And then we also get into some things like Ishvara Pranidhana, uh, where this, this niyama promotes the surrendering of one's ego pride in a way that recognizes that you're part of a force larger than your own self. You're like a continuation of the line of your parents and, a, and of life itself, even, even going back to the moon and the stars and all the things that predated your embodiment. And that this surrender can alleviate the burden of self-judgment and pave the way for greater self-acceptance. There are other things you know, like practice itself, uh, where you're just encouraged to practice consistently and let go of attachments to the results. And that really helps one to accept the current state of things, including self-acceptance, the state of the self. And we'll talk a little bit more about that with Gabriella. So she's a pretty powerful teacher. She's uh, through menopause now, uh, but about 18 years ago in London, she delved into yoga during her own transition into motherhood. She was grappling with her expectations of motherhood and her own tendencies toward perfectionism. And in that, yoga became an essential lifeline. The yoga journey grounded her as an expat, especially while raising three kids in a foreign land. And she opened a small yoga studio, which later expanded. But the challenges of motherhood, coupled with the demands of teaching, led to burnout and an autoimmune condition by her early 40s. And this health setback steered her towards gentler practices like yoga nidra or the yoga of rest. And as she entered into perimenopause, yoga once again served as her anchor with a particular emphasis on breath work. She often found solace just by getting up and her yoga was lying over a bolster and, and doing deep breathing. So throughout her life, teaching yoga has been a vital source of grounding during pivotal moments. And I bring this conversation to you because she's running a program on yoga and menopause. And we all know whether you're in menopause, you're a man who has challenging testosterone shifts or life shifts, or whether you're a woman who's in menopause and you're experiencing hormonal shifts and all the things that go with that period of life, which include reckoning with where you've come and possibly empty nest stuff, like whatever it is that yoga can help, you know, so we begin by talking about teachers and kinds of yoga, and then we drop into highly specific practices and invitations uh, for things like bone density and pelvic floor health, as well as where I started with deep self-acceptance. 
Gabriella is a menopause and sexual wellness coach, a yoga and somatic movement teacher, and the founder of Women's Body Wisdom, an online coaching platform that empowers women to own their pleasure, power, and purpose in midlife. She contributes her writing on yoga and women's health to leading publications in the U.S. and in Great Britain, and she's had features in things like Oprah Daily. My yoga journey began about 25 years ago. I was seeking balance in a busy professional career, corporate (laughs) career, marketing and PR. It took me around the world. And I found, or yoga found me, in a gym in in um, downtown San Francisco where I was working at the time and you know I had been a dancer and a gymnast so for me it felt very much aligned with the way my body moved and felt in the world and it was an Iyengar yoga class and so what I loved about Iyengar yoga at that time was the precision to detail, the discipline, of course, the, the, the focus on philosophy, the yoga sutras, the yamas, niyamas, the pranayama, right? All the breath practices. So it just opened a whole world of just being in my body from a place of grounding, clarity, and connection. And it's just been my my true and steadfast companion um, throughout enormous periods of change. It's anchored me through being a career woman, through motherhood, being an entrepreneur, um, menopause, empty nesterhood, which I'm now entering, and also now post-menopause. Can you tell me a little bit about your teachers? Oh, wow. Yes. So, as I said, I started off in the Iyengar method, training in the Iyengar method. So uh, in London, I trained with um, Alaric Newcomb. So he is a um, very well-established Iyengar teacher there. And, and I trained earlier with, with Leela Miller, also an Ashtanga teacher there. Anna Ashby, who really introduced me more to a somatic-based um, approach to yoga, and that also helped me during my um, during these big periods of change. Um, I've studied in the meditation field with Sally Kempton, with Carlos Pomeda in the yoga philosophy and everything that had to do with yoga philosophy. Oh my gosh, so many teachers, Richard Rosen, Bill Mahoney, <laughs> all of them really um, opened the door to just this self inner exploration that I feel is such a gift for me and and, and the people I coach. Mm -hmm. I mean, I think of yoga kind of as snow sports, like you can't just say I do snow sports. It's like you're, you're downhill skiing and cross country skiing and snowboarding and, you know, uh, whatever. So when I think about um, yoga, for those of you who don't know the various schools, Iyengar is a, both Iyengar and Patavi Joyce, who are the sort of the people who brought yoga to the West, they taught very different styles of yoga, but they have the same teacher, TKS uh, Desikachar. And Iyengar is more of a slow practice using props, very focused on alignment, and Ashtanga moves a lot more. So when Gabrielle is talking about uh, Iyengar, it, it's very precise, isn't it? It's very precise and demanding. Very, very precise and attention to detail and holding the postures for a longer period of time, right? So you're spending 30, 40, 50 seconds, you know, I, um, in a pose and, and it's that time that's spent in a pose, whatever comes up for you, that, that discomfort, the thoughts, the, you know, the, um, the get me out of this, right? That is the practice, right? That discomfort, knowing how to manage the sensations um, that come up during the actual pose, that, that, is, that is the practice of yoga, I feel, and how you manage the discomfort and the, the sensations and the thoughts. Um, that's part of it. Also, it's very, very precision and alignment focused. And so there is a sense of perfection, which I feel (laughs) ultimately heightened my own perfectionist tendencies. But um, it worked for me and my body at that time. I needed that that structure, but it also allowed me to move inwards to all of, you know, everything that was arising for me in the moment of being in a pose was was this 
the experience. That was the yoga. That was the work that I had to to do. And so that's been such a huge gift. And he had us in a very difficult pose and we were there for a long time. And he said, okay, so now what are you thinking? How are you talking to yourself? Are you being critical? Do you want to leave? Because I guarantee however you're talking to yourself right now is how you talk to yourself off the mat. And um, that was like, whoa, that's incredible. <laughs> um, but, the, but the reason I wanted to go back and understand your base trading and lay that out for people is what when you're telling your journey, it sounds like a really beautiful evolution. And I think it's, it's like Picasso. Not a lot of people know that when he painted originally, he painted photographic quality representations, like of, of giant court scenes at the ultimate detail. And his abstraction and his innovation came after the mastery of these beautiful, highly disciplined practice. Uh, so it feels to me like with an Ashtanga and an Iyengar base, and then, you know, you have the, the sort of the right to innovate and listen around what's good for your body, but you have this strong basis. And I, I think that's a, yeah, worthy of exploration. Yeah, no, and, and like you said, it, it is a very physically demanding practice. You know, they, we, we often talk about listening to your body, but at, at that time when I was practicing yoga, um, it, it, you know, it hadn't evolved. Yoga has evolved so much. I know you, you can speak to this as well, how much yoga has evolved in terms of making it more accessible and using language that's, that's, that's friendlier, right? I was with really hardcore teachers who, you know, pushed us, pushed us and ex, you know, exerted this this sense of discipline over the body, having your, you know, having your mind control the body, right? So it wasn't so much about, you know, letting yourself, you know, just be in the pose like we talk about now, or just making, just doing the pose in a way that suits your body. No, you had to conform to certain shapes and adhere to certain sequences. So it was a very rigid, I felt at the time. I mean, at the time, reflecting back, I feel it was a very rigid practice, but it served me then. I needed that that discipline and that discipline has served me in so many aspects of my life. Um, and when I became ill with this autoimmune condition and then when I headed into menopause, I really realized that I had to shift my focus. And so the beauty, I, I guess what I'm trying to say is that yoga, there's so many practices to turn to. So if you want a more, you know, more disciplined, physical approach um, to um, interacting with your body, there are practices like Ashtanga and Iyengar, but then there are beautiful, more restorative practices, the, you know, the yoga nidra, the yoga of rest, of sleep. There's yin yoga, which I also love, which allowed me to also turn to more mindful, uh, more of a mindfulness-based approach of just being with whatever was arising in a, in a pose. Um, so I think there's so much to explore. I, I, I guess I'm speaking to people who have never practiced yoga. Um, there are so many entry points into the yoga practice and yoga really is accessible to every body. Um, I think you just have to find the right teacher and the right practice that, that suits your lifestyle and your body at whatever particular phase of life you're in. There's something in this piece around dominating the body and disciplining it that when you get this autoimmune condition or you hand in a perimenopause and the body seems to have, you know, it's doing its thing and you can't really control it anymore. And I feel there's a there's a piece that we should explore in there about the mindset when the body begins to change. You know, are you going to resist it? Are you going to go with it? Are you going to try every supplement and every fix? You know, how, how do you even approach philosophically the life change of perimenopause and menopause in a way that welcomes harmony with the body? Yeah, I love that question. That's that's been my my lifelong um exploration i feel since since um since beginning yoga and and also the different hormonal shifts that that we um inevitably experience as women they they take us into you know the this unfamiliar territory of um, of fluctuating hormones of fluctuating emotions and and physical sensations and i think it's it doesn't help that you know we've been conditioned to feel that the body should look and be a certain way so especially as women and so we begin to feel that our bodies are no longer working that we're broken or that we need to be um, fixed in some way 
I definitely feel menopause. Perimenopause is one of those shifts in our in in a woman's life in which we need a new narrative to experience our bodies differently. And I feel it's a time to embrace this transition and to connect with the the rich and, and multi-layered aspects of being female from a place of curiosity, openness, um, compassion, acceptance, and, and a lot of the work that I do with women um, in my yoga teaching and in my coaching is allowing them to come to a place of acceptance of where they are in their particular stage of life. I'm pausing there to to just reflect. Yeah, one of the things that um, women often say to me when they when they come to me is, I don't recognize myself anymore. When I look at myself in the mirror, I don't recognize the body that I'm in. And it really is a process of returning to yourself, right? The, the practices of yoga that they teach us, right? To re- returning to your wholeness, that all bodies are whole and complete and beautiful just as they are. And it is a, a, a matter of really shifting the stories, the narratives we carry around about our bodies and engaging in practices that really allow us to appreciate these amazing vessels of life that that we that we have that we've been gifted. I want to say Paul Grilly. Do you remember him, Paul? Oh yeah, him? yeah, yeah. I studied with him too. Yeah, the yoga anatomy guy. Um, mm-hmm. So there's this guy, people who uh, would start his workshops on yoga anatomy by bringing people from the room up to the front and lining them up next to each other, maybe five or 10 people. And then he would have them hold their arms out. And there's a thing in yoga called a carrying angle, which is the angle between the elbow and the forearm. And Mm -hmm, depending mm -hmm. on how that went, you would tune your practice to, you know, either bend the elbow a little bit more, extend the elbow a little more, use more muscle tone. And then you'd have particular escape valves in the posture uh, that you would tend toward. But he also said that to look at like the hip opening, that people would Mm -hmm. have such shame about not being able to do the splits or being flexible, when in reality, the bone of their femur was just hitting the inside opening of the hip socket. And they were never, no matter how much stretching they ever did, going to get wider uh, in their their wide-legged forward bend. It was never going to happen. And when I was looking at that, I thought about all the moral judgment and the shame about being perfect or like doing a posture right or getting it to look a certain way that I had carried. Um, and then I'm looking at these bodies and there's a long, lanky grasshopper girl and there's like a woman who looks like she could win a boxing match. And they were all so beautiful and they were never going to do the same things. And it was just such a, mm-hmm. a moment of pause to kind of mm. see it from how he was seeing it. And then he shows x-rays of bone structures and yeah. was trying, yeah. it was so magical in a lot of ways. I love, I, I remember that, um, yeah, he shows all those pelvises, right? And how they're photographed of all those pelvises and how they look so, so different one from the other, right? I just found that image so astonishingly beautiful, but also, yeah, like I said, so eye-opening. And um, when you, because I love looking at um, anatomical pictures and um, anatomy guides are my my favorite, (laughs) just looking at the wonder, right? Just it's so like, oh my gosh, how wondrous and awe-inspiring is um, a body. And when you look at how unique everyone's body is, you can then look at it from that place of like, awe and wonder and wholeness like we're all made so beautiful just the way that we are you know that also goes to speak to our own experience of moving through midlife and menopause each of our journeys is going to be different given our you know biological and physical and emotional makeup and so really making it um an individual journey for you really making it a journey of getting to know yourself better 
um, not only at a physical level, but an emotional and um, level and an energetic level, really using this opportunity to get to know yourself so that you can step into really the best version of yourself and, and, and from a place of acceptance and also compassion. You know, just because you can't do that, that split or you'll never be able to touch your toes doesn't mean that you're not whole and perfectly well-made just the way that you are. I was with family this last 10 days and it's people from, you know, I think the youngest is 10, but women from 25 to 80. And the feeling tone of being sort of somewhere in the middle or toward the end, it, there is a sense of grief or loss or something. And I'm, you know, still fit and active and all of those things. And there's a piece of just saying like, do I accept this life stage and what does it mean that I find myself dealing with? It is a constant dialogue that we have with ourselves. Our bodies are meant to change, right? And so if we accept that, that our bodies are meant to change, but what do we do with the bodies that we have? And so I feel that these life transitions, especially menopause or postmenopause, is really an invitation to get to know ourselves better, get to know our bodies better, and really focus on upgrading. I always say upgrading our physical, mental, and emotional selves to the best version possible. And so engaging in practices and lifestyle choices that uh, are really aimed for at aging well and um, ensuring that you have a healthy and long um, lifespan. And so you know, I, I feel fortunate that I have some great role models in my own family. My my father is 90 years old and he's an amazing, he, an amazing health. He goes for long power walks on the beach w- near where he lives. He's still at the gym lifting weights. My mother, who's 86, has always focused on really taking care of her body and um, is still physically fit and active. And I, I feel like, okay, I have role models to, to look up to, right? I can do this. I can get through this. And, um, and, and, you know, sadly, many of us don't have those, those role models. And uh, I think it's important to, to surround yourself with people who will encourage you to live a healthy and and long life. So if it means getting together with a group of friends to to go to yoga or for a walk or join a running club, whatever, a swimming club, whatever it takes to surround yourselves with people who will support you in um, in aging and um, well and living a long, healthy life is, is so, so important. So that's who I surround myself with. Right, it's summertime now. So right now my my kids are at home and they all hit hit the gym. I have two boys and a daughter and they're, you know, they're big gym enthusiasts. My daughter loves yoga. So, you know, we all together as a family engage in, in, in physical fitness activities and um, make sure that's a priority. So you know, physical fitness, eating well, healthy lifestyle, we make a top, top priority. And it's something that I feel is important, right, in terms of who you you surround yourself with. Let's talk about the yoga part of healing the body in midlife. Like I know there are a lot of poses for endocrine regulation and thyroid and all of that stuff. But do you think there's a particular asanas that help with hormonal balances and managing the changes? Yeah, I feel that yoga is one of the best forms of movement for for women as we move into the menopause transition. So we know that stress is a big driver of a lot of the the menopause symptoms, a lot of the uh, hormonal imbalances that, that we experience. So I love to start with just the basics and 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 starting off with with breath work. I feel breath work is a beautiful way to regulate the nervous system, move you into that parasympathetic rest and restore state. So I often and I, I feel like we're always, um, you know, so busy running around, disconnected from our bodies, and we don't breathe properly. So I always start with the very basics and teaching women how 
how to breathe properly, just starting with very simple diaphragmatic breathing and then moving on to um, other pranayama practices. And I, uh, I also love, love, love restorative yoga as a way of relaxing and restoring the body. So we need to bring the body into that parasympathetic relaxed and restore state so that we can you know lower our cortisol levels you know high cortisol levels really do a number on dysregulating our hormones so restorative yoga long held postures on bolsters yin yoga also offers that that opportunity of you know staying in poses for a longer period of time and working with the breath and working with um, being present to what is what is arising in the body. So um, again, I just always start with breath work and more restorative practices like yin um, or even yoga nidra, the you know the yoga of sleep. I love love that as a as a practice to bringing us into um, that that place of deep deep rest, which is so necessary to restore the the body during this transition. For sure. Tell me a little bit about the program that you guys are running. Oh, so I'm um, I teach uh, on an online platform called Movement for Modern Life, and so Movement for a Modern Life has um, created a um, Menopause for Modern Life program. It's the first of its kind Menopause Yoga program, and so we brought together uh, experts in um, different modalities. We have yoga classes, audio interviews, educational information on the menopause transition. It really helps um, give women practical advice on how to manage the physical, psychological, and emotional symptoms of, of menopause. And so the classes really help you through the symptoms. There are specific classes that help you address certain symptoms um, like bone strength, um, pelvic floor um, support, hot flashes, sleep, all the collection of, of symptoms that we experience during the menopause transition are supported either by nutritional and lifestyle guidance on the course as well as, you know, over, I think they're over about reaching 40 and 50 um, movement-based classes for all experience levels. And we also have a, a private Facebook group to help you share your experiences with others um, who are going through the process so that you can form a sense of, of community. So it's really suitable for everyone who is interested in understanding more about menopause, those in who are entering perimenopause, and for all levels of yoga experience from absolute beginners to to experienced practitioners. I love that you mentioned those specific symptoms. Bone density, for example, that's really helped with weight-bearing exercise. So most of the standing postures would seem to help that. Oh, absolutely. Yoga helps address um, several of the key pillars of bone health, right, which are balance, muscular engagement, and weight bearing. Those are the three pillars of, you know, creating strong bones. And so, you know, a lot of the standing poses, as you say, do that. It, they tick all those three boxes, right? You know, being able to hold the poses for longer also helps with, with the bone density. The longer you're able to hold the pose, the more that you have that, that muscle tension, which stimulates the bone growing cells. There are specific classes for, for bone strength. Um, on the, there are about two or three classes specific to, to bone strength on, on the course. There was a, a, a research study done by Dr. Lauren Fishman, who is a doctor of osteopathy, I believe, and a yoga teacher. And he conducted this study with a group of um, menopausal women, um, whereby he gave them 12 yoga poses to do over a period of six months, right? So these women did 15 to 20 minutes of these specific yoga poses daily for a period of six months, and they all experience improvements in bone density. So a lot of the um, the poses that were in this study are your typical standing postures in the Hatha yoga, you know, the tree pose, the warrior poses, the downward dog poses, 
all of the poses which um, again engage the muscles um, help you bear weight through the feet the hands and that also help you establish a sense of balance all key pillars of, of bone health and what about the i mean i know the pelvic floor too for a lot of women as they age you have leaking urinary incontinence kind of stuff you have all kinds of um, strain particularly if you let have a lot of children like you did or I did, uh, that there are some things that can help contain that pelvic basin. There's the root lock and all of that kind of stuff. But what are you specifically seeing in that part of the classes? Oftentimes with pelvic floor dysfunction, you know, women feel that the urinary incontinence or the leaking, those more embarrassing symptoms means that, oh, my, my pelvic floor muscles are weak or they're loose right? And so I need to tighten them and I need to do my kegels or the pelvic floor locks that were taught in yoga. But oftentimes, you know, the stress and tension we hold in our bodies, especially as we're navigating menopause, not only because of the symptoms, because of also day-to-day -day stressors. If you're, you have teenagers or you're, you know, also tending to um, elderly parents, just the demands of life causes to hold tension in our bodies. So the that creates tension and contraction in the pelvic floor. So many of us are and, and we also sit for long periods of time if you're if you're working at a desk, right? So that um, causes us to contract and tighten the pelvic floor. So many of us are walking around with excessively tight pelvic floors. And and that excessive tightness in the pelvic floor, that hypertonic pelvic floor, is what weakens the pelvic floor. So you don't want, you know, the pelvic floor is like a muscle, right? You don't want to keep contracting that muscle. You want to elongate and expand that muscle, add some mobility to that muscle. So we work on poses that add strength and stability. So that's, that is needed. So your, your, your squats, your yogic squats, um, your, your warrior poses, all of those poses do a little, you know, mild contraction of the pelvic floor, but you also want to have, have, have some mobility to the pelvic floor. So you have your cat cows or you, your forward bends. So it's really bringing um, a greater degree of mobility to the pelvic floor. And then um, my favorite are, you know, just engaging in gentle hip circles, which isn't a specific yoga pose, it's bringing more of a, of a somatic based approach, but um, just gentle hip circles um, so that you want to bring that sense of relaxation to the whole pelvic bowl. And so, um, and then we also do a little bit of, you know, self-exploration. I always send women home with doing a little self-exploration to see really where they notice the, the tightness in their pelvic floor. Sometimes it's on one side, sometimes it's on the other side. Um, and just bringing that awareness, breath, breath work is also really, really beneficial for bringing a sense of relaxation and awareness to the pelvic floor as well. So there are a variety of practices and those are all also on the, on the yoga course. Mm. Yeah, I think by the time you look at sort of here are the body specific, the stage specific symptoms, and then you look at the wide variety of things you can prescribe, um, you're really getting some solutions. Even the stuff around sleep, like the yoga nidra that you mentioned, which, you know, I, sometimes I'll wake up at three o'clock in the morning and I'll just drop in and I'll do a little deep breath work, box breath or a little mantra until I have returned or like self-hypnotized back to sleep. And I never used to have that. So if you're one of those people who's waking up in the middle of the night or like waking up at five o'clock in the morning and you're just like, ah, you know, I need a couple more hours. There are tools for that too. Oh, absolutely. I always used to keep a little um, yoga nidra recording <laughs> next to me that I would turn on if I woke up in the middle of the night and just listen to that. Or I would, you know, coach myself through a yoga nidra practice. I also find, you know, self-soothing um, practices, you know, using touch, just even hand on heart, hand on belly, and using that tactile sensation of letting um, the body know that you're there to support her. So using breath work with a sense with with tactile sensation um, through through touch is also really, really helpful. And then there are the restorative poses. And I always keep 
a bolster next to my bed. So if I need to just ro roll out of bed and just come and lie on my bolster, it's such a soothing salve for me to know that I have some support there. So my bolster has always been my 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 best friend. Not a great travel companion. I don't. I'm not able to travel with it. But that's one thing I make sure if I go stay in a hotel or you know go into the, into whatever um, gym or yoga studio and try to see if I can make up some type of prop um, use some type of prop to create a, a bowl so you can use, also use cushions from a sofa so uh, or pillows from your bed just you know stack them up and, and create that that beautiful supportive bolster like experience. So where do you think you are now in how you identify Gabriella? Who are you and who is your body? Like, what is your relationship to body and identity now that you've gone through all of these life stages? How do you, if the body's always changing, it's not really you, but where have you landed with that? Mm, I love that question. I really um, love this beautiful Sanskrit word. I don't know if you've heard of it. Sukrita, you know, Sukrita, the yogic scriptures refer to the body as sukrita, um, which translate into well-made and beautiful. And so it describes the essence of our wholeness, you know, and, and just knowing that I'm whole and perfect just the way that we are, right? Free, when we, when we can free ourselves of the internalized beliefs and cultural and systemic conditioning, we come into this remembrance that all bodies are sukrita and and well made and that has been a huge journey for me right as as women you know are self loathing and comparisons and envy constant striving for the ideal body puts us at war with our own bodies and the bodies of others right that's then that's been part of my my journey um and and after giving birth to a daughter right 21 years ago I, I really made a conscious choice to show up differently in my body, kinder, more loving and accepting because I knew the thoughts and beliefs about my body would impact her. And then also when I began interacting with other bodies as a teacher, I, I knew I had to be at peace with my own body to appreciate and embrace the full spectrum and, and wholeness of all bodies that were in front of me. So really coming into that place of of, of acceptance and acknowledge that my body is perfect and whole just the way that it is and really seeing it as you know my my grandmother used when I was growing up used to always tell me your body is a temple you know look after your body as though it were a temple I approach my body with great reverence and and look after my body with care and attention and I don't think it's it's selfish or vain. I think it's it's essential to really have that reverence for for the body, and it's it's truly a gift to live in this vessel, right? So, you know, making the most of this body that we're given while while we're here on on Earth is so so important. Well, before we close today, I want to read you this quote from Bell Hooks. I really love her book, All About Love: New Visions. And it's not like romantic love. It's like that deep, loving intensity as a philosophy, a love ethic. She says, those of us who have already chosen to embrace a love ethic, allowing it to govern and inform how we think and act, know that when we let our light shine, we draw to us and are drawn to other bearers of light. We are not alone. So that's what I wish for you today, that no matter what's happening, the perceived imperfections of your day or your life or you or the people around you, that we drop that judgment. We remember ahimsa, the nonviolence towards self and others, and embrace that love ethic, that we walk in the beauty way. You can find me on Instagram at the.rose.woman. You can find Rosebud Woman there also and visit rosewoman.com for the finest in intimate care and body care products for all stages of your perfect life.